Hunters by Brandon Kemble Mahalik was recalling his first encounter with the devil when the wind shifted slightly, rippling the tall grass in which he and Convan were laying. They took the opportunity to move forward again, glancing to the sky. He noted that clouds were slowly rolling in, obscuring the stars. That meant the wind would continue to pick up, and the two of them would be able to cover substantial ground. If the grass stopped moving, then they would have to as well. Although the camel cloaks they each wore would make them all but invisible. The Tau sentries wore helmets with amplified vision, and the perimeter drones were equipped with motion trackers. To stay completely hidden, he and Corvon had to move in conjunction with the cover. When the brush moved, they moved. When the world was silent, so were they. Adapting oneself to the environment, that is the Katachan way. The way of their enemy, on the other hand, was very different. The Tau had arrived on Kininithia weeks ago, thinking it to be largely undeveloped and unpopulated. Perfect world for them to colonize. The Karachans, who for generations had used the vast grassy plains and dense lethal jungles as training grounds, begged to differ. They mastered nearly every piece of armor they had and threw it at the interlopers. When it was over, however, the Tau's accuracy and superior range prevailed. Had the planet been occupied by a different regiment, things would have likely ended in capitulation. But this was a Karachan world. The struggle to evict the Tau was devolving into a series of guerrilla actions, and although such a prospect would have seemed grim to most other soldiers, it was one of the Imperium's famed jungle fighters relished. How the aliens would deal with it was the big question. Something pulled at the leg of Malik's pants, he froze and looked over his shoulder. Behind him, Corvon tapped his minicomp on his wrist and then held up a pair of fingers. Halleck understood the gesture. They are two hours until the sun would rise. They had to be in position and ready to fire by that time, or the entire mission would be a failure. He nodded to Corvon, responded with a hand signal of his own that said, they were very close to the target, and continued making his way forward. Throughout the night, their goal had been to reach a particular tree that stood 200 feet inside the overgrown park. It had a wide trunk to hide behind and a large burl of roots that would make an excellent rifle nest. And it had a car smashed into it. At some point during the Tau's occupation of the town, one of the local civilians had apparently driven his ground car up over the curb and plowed it right into the tree. The front end had crumpled horribly, and the chassis was angled sharply upwards, creating a sheltered area better than any duck behind either Mahalik or Corvon could ever have built for themselves. Had the hand of some benevolent god reached down and placed the wreck before them, it couldn't have made a more perfect firing position. Thirty minutes of hard crawling, and they finally arrived. Their clothes were damp, the skin on their chest and elbows was raw from the constant contact with the ground. Their faces and hands were covered with insect bites. They dragged themselves underneath the wreck and rolled over onto their backs, staring up into the dark. I knew what time it was, Mahala kissed. They were the first words he uttered all night. What? Govon was panting. Mahala didn't know if the other man was short of breath because he was out of shape, or because of the gaping wound in his chest where the Tau had stabbed him earlier. 
A bit of both, he suspected bitterly. I said, I knew what time it was. You didn't have to stop and tell me. I just thought I should remind you. We didn't have to. And you a spoiler, not a babysitter. There was a moment of quiet between them before he asked Corvon how he was feeling. My ribs are on fire, he said. I think, I think this wound is opened up again. My bandages are soaked. That complicates things. Ola groaned. We haven't got any more replacements. We hang on till we're on our way back to the outer town. You just worry about yourself. Corvon growled. Mahalik's fuse was running as short as Corvon's. I will then, he snapped. Get me my ranging info. Don't order me around. I know my job. Corvon began pulling out his equipment. From a tubular case hooked onto his belt, he pulled out a battered micro lens and a short computer cable. One end he snapped into his minicom, and the other into the electronic viewer. Mohawk wondered, not for the first time, how ancient and revered these two pieces must have been. Then he focused on his own gear. Many snipers across the Imperium swore by the long-barreled lasgun. It had pinpoint accuracy and covered the distance from shoot to the target almost instantaneously. However, its major drawback was that the searing white-hot beam of light could be easily traced back to its source by even a casual observer. Holick had no intention of making things that easy for the Tau, and so he instead decided to use a bolt-action rifle in solid slugs. In his mind, bullets more than made up in reliability what they lacked in technological extra vantage. For days, his rifle had been cocooned in a camouflage waterproof sleeve. Now, he unwrapped it carefully, attached a suppressor to the end of the muzzle, and checked the ammo feed. He had five rounds in the magazine, six more clips on his bandolier. It was more than enough, an orgy of munitions in fact. We had no intention of being killed this day, or lack of firing back. The quiet of the night was soon disturbed by an explosion far off in the distance. Mohawk and Kodavain both paused in their preparations and lay in frozen silence. A minute went past. A second detonation rolled through the air from the most distant corner of the town. Then a third, and a fourth. Pascal, Kovon whispered. Give him hell, brother, Mohawk muttered. He would have toasted the man's success had there been anything to raise a glass with. But his canteen was long gone now. Lane drained and destroyed in a halfway of a filthy hab block. He suddenly remembered how thirsty he was. Golden throne. He thought. Even Corvon's detestable homebrew would have tasted like sweet nectar right about now. This stuff is terrible. Nolik said, rubbing his mouth with the back of his hand. Why does it taste minty? Irvon shrugged and took a sip from his own tin cup. His head shook reflexively as the contents worked its way down his gullet. Probably because I made it out of fermented fern pine needles. That's all I could find. You don't like it? You don't drink it. Warwick looked over his shoulder. Beyond the open tent flap, he could see the rest of the camp. The jungle foliage here was not so thick as to completely block out the sun, and the small waterfalls poured down through a canopy of red leaves. Katachan soldiers, some under Mahawk's command, some under Corvon's, huddled beneath topinins and wax canvas sheets strung between the trees. The ground was a thick soup of mud and rotten leaves that clung to their boots and trouser legs. They sat quietly, cleaning their weapons, or sharpening their combat knives. 
A few cooking fires burned low and smokeless. There was no complaining. They were jungle fighters, after all. Every one of them. This type of environment was where they were most at home. Still, Paula can clearly see that there was no sparring contest. No racist or browdy jokes being told. Men were quiet, dour, joyless. Weeks of constant retreat and defeat at the hands of the Tao were dragging morale into grim and dangerous depths. Mahalik included. He turned back to Corvon. Well, I'll drink it, he said, and poured the remaining contents of his cup down his throat in a single sweep, concentrating so as to not throw it back up. Beats going sober in this place. Corvon pointed and said, here he comes, finally. Outside, carriage and soldiers were arriving, streaming in from half a dozen narrow pathways. In the otherwise broke, unbroken foliage, their heavy boots were caked with mud, their battle fatigues were filthy and torn. Each of them wore a green armored plate over their left shoulder, embezzled with the white winged skull and the number XXVI. Several of them, upon entering the clearing, collapsed down to sit in the muck, lacking even energy to stumble or crawl underneath the shelter. Among them was a tall figure who wore a red scarf tied around his forehead, as well as a secondary one on his right bicep. He had dark circles under his eyes, and his cheeks were hollow. He spoke briefly with one of Corvin's men who by comparison looked as fit and energetic as a first season recruit. And then he entered into the tent. Corvon extended his hand to the newcomer. Basco, he sighed. I was getting worried. Couldn't be helped, the man replied slowly. He claps Corvon's forearm in a familiar greeting. We've been falling back from the plains for a week now, on foot. We managed to hold the blues up as long as we could, but it cost us all of our transports. Well, we sure as hell owe you one, Corvon said. He poured a fresh cup of his homemade alcohol and afforded it. He bought us the time we needed to relocate up here to the mountains, Ezra. Have you two ever actually met? Horlick shook his head. Mark, leader of the Katachan 51st, the Black Vipers. Pascal nodded. Leader, Katachan 26th, the Lurking Cobras. He drank from the cup slowly and unflinchingly. Its burning aftertaste affecting him or not in the least. Corvon and Mahalik exchanged a glance, both wondering how burnt out their compatriot must be. When he was done, Pascal exhaled slowly and said, Black vapors, but you took a real pounding in the initial assault wave. We lost a lot of good men, yeah? Maholik muttered. He had recalled the case with which the Xenos invaders had overrun one position after another. His sniper corps had never shirked their duty, though never wavered in their resolve. They kept on shooting enemy squad leaders and identifying important personnel right up until the last second when some alien weapon barrage engulfed them in a fiery blast. Carvon set himself on an enemy ammo crate and motioned for Pascal to do likewise. So, here we are, he said. The last remaining leaders... A Kathira's defense force. Risky to have us all meet in one place. Pascal muttered. His weariness readied out through every part of him, including his voice. The tower could end us right here, now, if they wanted. Risky. Stupid more like it. The Hollick grumbled. Gordvon spread his hands in apology. I had no choice. 
Four days ago, the last of our satellites went down. The planetary comm lines all belong to Tau now. If we'd done this over the air, even short-range radio, they'd been able to listen to it. Besides, they can't come into the jungle. Their forces are all geared for fighting in open country. You're certain of that? Rahalik raised his eyebrows and looked at Carvon sternly. Since the day of their first arrival, he had seen the foe employ a wide variety of military hardware, most of it so advanced that alien can it hurt his brain to even try and consider it. I've seen them hit a target with a volley of missiles launched from beyond visual range. Corvon, it's not natural. Robots do, Basco said. Like a big dinner plate turned upside down, with some kind of pulse weapon attached. Not much on their own, but they feel so many of them. His eyes lost focus for a moment, as he relived some previous disaster known only by him. The crafty, all right. I'll give them that, Corvon said. But I think I figured out how to stop them dead in their tracks. Pascal sat forward intently. All the desperation was suddenly gone from his voice, replaced with vitriol. Oh. Corvon leaned in and spoke in a low voice, as if afraid that even here the enemy might be eavesdropping. The Tau have a chain of command that's totally inflexible. Every soldier looks to his squad leader for orders and obeys them without question. Every squad leader looks to his company commander for guidance. And the commanders... Who do they answer to? Pasco said eagerly. That's just it. We had no idea. For all we know, they operate like we do, with senior officers conducting their own operations, working largely on their own initiatives. But... Mahalik snickered. Headless snakes. Corvon and Pasco looked at him. After a second, he elaborated. Back on Karachan, when I was a kid, I apprenticed under this old veteran. Kirsop. He used to say that we were headless snakes, that a Katachan army couldn't be crippled by taking out a single, all-encompassing leader because we had none. Some ancient expression about the serpent's head in its body. Smartest way to run things. Pascal agreed. Which is why it's so surprising that the Tau don't do it too. Carvon smiled now and reached for a brown leather carrying bag that lay near his feet. From it he withdrew several grainy black and white picks. They had obviously been taken at a very long range, but in each of them, a central figure was a Tau. He wore complicated-looking, multi-layered robots, with a laughably tall collar piece that stretched up beyond his head. Around his neck was a clunky medallion, he carried a thin staff in one hand that was crowned with an apparently purposeless, semi-symmetrical design. His face was completely alien, no discernible nose, beady little eyes, and wide slit for a mouth. So my men shaped these while doing long-range recon. Carvon handed the picks to Pascal, who squinted at them intently. The alien's bearing and attire struck some chord of familiarity with them. A priest, he guessed. Carvon nodded. They call them ethereals. Near as well. Near as we can tell. They're the Tau ultimate authority of this world. You take this guy out, the whole army will drift like rudderless swamp boats. Rolik looked over at the other two. They are both smiling now, swept up with some promise that the war for Cathenia might actually turn in their favor with one quick stroke. Yet, he was apprehensive. He plucked the pictures from Pascal, 
and scrutinized them. Carvon, he said. I must have sniped a dozen priests in my life and not one of them, whose past caused a whole army to freeze up. Can this guy be so important? Carvon's eyes narrowed as he regarded the hood. Two platoons died bringing me this intelligence, he said coldly. I trust it. Where were these taken? Pasco cut in. Bowed to the park, in one of the civilian colony sites. It's a town central now. The engineering teams have put up a landing field and command post there because they thought it was better to build on empty land instead of demolishing half the town. Carvon shrugged. More efficient, maybe. Warlock furrowed his brow. True. Using the colony's large and open area was the fastest way for the Blues to establish a principal command. On the other hand, it also meant that their most important leaders and decision-makers were hemmed in on all sides by pre-existing buildings any one of which could make excellent cover for snipers or heavy weapon teams. For a supposedly intelligent species with a highly disciplined army, it struck him as being a really stupid move. What exactly are I proposing, Corvon? Mahalik asked, though he already knew the answer. That we go in, and we get him. Pasco's thirst for revenge was suddenly tempered by caution, a trait shared by all experienced Katachans. When a man spent his entire life fighting where the environment could kill as easily as an enemy's weapon, if not more so, he either took the time to consider everything before acting, or he died in vain. This is no simple undertaking, he said slowly. Ow. Will we even get there? Carvon held up a finger. We've exactly one Valkyrie left, stashed nearby under a mountain of camo sheeting. It can take us to the insurrection point outside the town, well beyond the anti-air defenses. We survive. It'll be there to ferry us out. We'll have to interfere through the occupied portions of the colony site. And the only the Emperor knows what kind of security they'll have in place. That is why it's got to be just us three. Any larger party will be caught for sure. But three men, three highly experienced men, with camel cloaks and essential gear, might just be all right. What makes you think we'll ever catch him out in the open? Mohawk asked Corvon bitterly. If this priest is so precious, what's to say the blues don't put him into a bunker a mile below the ground or some such place? He gives daily sermons out on the landing field for all the town to hear. Draws quite the crowd, I'm told. All about the glory of the greater good. The what? The greater good. It's a little version of the ecclesiarchy. Carvon reached back down once more into his carrying bag and withdrew a data slate. He tossed it to Mholik, who caught it with one hand. I got it from this. Xeno archives. Most of it is 200 years old and more. But there's a fair amount of stuff in there we can use. Mahalik looked up coldly. You keep saying we. Who died and made you planetary governor? Marvon rose to his feet. If you have a better idea how to turn things around, by all means, let's hear it. Mahalik wished like hell that a moment he had an alternative plan. But he didn't. Like all the others, he was tired of falling back, sick of being beaten by the blues. He wanted nothing more than to kill every last one of them. But Carvon's mission was a one-shot. All or nothing. 
Stab in the dark, based on centuries-old data and some sketchy field intelligence. It was like walking into a blind alley. Maholic hadn't reached the ripe old age of 36 by allowing himself to be railroaded. He was a Katagen sniper who led the regiment of other Katagen snipers. Hit and fade was the mantra he lived by, and he always made certain that he had an escape route in everything that he did. He shook his head and began to skim through the data slate. There's just something that bothers me about this. He muttered. Like what? Pascal asked. I don't know. Something. Maybe I just don't like having only one option. Carvan sat back down again and started planning with Pascal as to what specific equipment they'd be taking. Maholok, in the meantime, began reading the data slate in earnest. It was nearly an hour later when he finally found what he was looking for, and when he showed it to the others, they couldn't help but agree with him. In the hour before sunrise, they were nearly caught. Carvone was busy with his spotter's duties surveying the area thoroughly, identifying potential problems and taking measurements of the wind and weather. Maholok lay very still, listening to the various sounds beyond the hidden spot. It had been nearly an hour since they had heard the last of Pascal's demo charges rumble through the streets like a distant thunder. The colony was now deathly quiet, save for a pair of venom droves cooing softly in the branches above them. Carvon coughed. <coughs> Compared to the quiet that preceded it, the sound was like the cracking of a whip. Bohollock's head snapped around, his eyes wide and fideous. He saw a Sparta, face down, his right arm wrapped tightly in front of his mouth and nose. Carvon's body shook with another, more muted cough. Several moments went by until he was certain the fit had passed. He pulled his arm away slowly, opened his mouth, and let a stream of mucousy blood run out. Then, he nodded to acknowledge that he was all right. While his eyes narrowed, he was about to whisper something when there came a sudden flapping of wings. The venom droves had been spooked away, but not by spasming of Carvon's punctured lungs. Together they peeked out through the knotted roots of the tree. At first they saw nothing, but then the crowds began to break, and in the gloomy indigo light that preceded the dawn, Corvon and Miholik could just barely make out the silhouette of a Tau patrol. There were twelve of them out there, standing perfectly still in grass that came up to their shoulders. The rifles held it ready, looking long and flat and lethal. Tense minutes went by, till the aliens apparently decided they hadn't heard anything unusual after all, and continued on their way. Mahalik slowly released the breath he had been holding, and counted to ten. Then he stared at Corvone, who was once again draining blood from his mouth onto the ground. His fury turned to genuine concern, and he asked to see the wound. It's nothing, Corvone hissed, and returned to his information gathering. Morlock could hear the other man's breathing, though. Raspy, gurgling, getting worse. Things had started out well enough. The Valkyrie had landed in the jungle clearing far outside the range of any Tau defense. Pascal and Carvone descended the rear ramp briskly and took a few moments to make a final check of their gear. Miholok walked to the perimeter of the landing zone, ensuring that anything else was in place. And the three of them made their way to the outskirts of the colony, 
For as long as they remained in the jungle, they didn't encounter a single Tao. However, as soon as they went across the trees to give way into the fields of grass, it all changed. Crouching within a thorny bush, the three men looked across a freshly plowed field. Fifty more humans, backs bent, were planting yellow stalks into the copper-colored earth. Their faces looked joyless. High above them floated several of the dinner plate robots that Pascal dreaded so much. From a large speaker mounted beneath, it spoke an oddly accented gothic. Embrace the greater good. Do not complain about your work, but consider its benefits to all society. There is unity between Tao and Min, between the higher and lower ranks, and between military work, political work, and rear service work. It is imperative to overcome anything that impairs this unity. What the hell? Mahorak breathed. Enslaving the civilians. Pascal spit into the dirt. Ovon grunted. They call it cultural assimilation. They skirted around the field, uncertain of whether the robots could identify them as enemy soldiers or simply see them as three more humans in a town filled with humans. The afternoon was growing late. When they finally entered the colony proper, they crept along the back alleyways, their camo cloaks making them appear as sections of crumbling rock or walls that have turned into heaps of trash. Every so often they would risk looking out into the streets, where throngs of people went about their business. As they got closer to Broldale Park, the number of towers standing about increased. Finally, as the shadows grew long, they crossed the parking lot filled with derelict ground cars and slipped through a metal door set into the back of a hab block. It was dark and cool in the hallway beyond, and all three men took a minute to gather themselves. All drank deeply of his canteen. Carvone tapped at his arm-mounted buter. Pascal struck a hand into one of his deep pockets and withdrew a small bottle. He snapped the lid off, using only his thumb, and dumped a cluster of four white pills into his mouth. Mahalik watched him swallow the lot. Stay awake, Pascal said lowly. He held the bottle out. Can't, Mahalik said, shaking his head. They made my head shake. Carvon looked at the two of them. All right, he said. This place is occupied. Many comp counts 300 life signs. But the other side of this building faced directly into the park. I counted five stories from the outside, Pascal said as they began to walk down the hall. I'm thinking the fourth floor. Should work, Warlock agreed. Top floor is too obvious a choice, and there's no way we're going to up to the roof with no cover overhead. The climb to stairway littered with garbage. On every landing, three of them took note of several large posters, recently applied. One showing a Tau in full combat armor, his head tilted up and away in a heroic pose that rang across all cultural lines. Do not fear was printed in blocky imperial gothic across the top and beneath it. The Tau are your friends. Some friends, Carvon said. He was pointing at a second poster that read, Report all studious behavior. Studious behavior. They emerged on the fourth floor. The halls were empty. But from within the apartments, they could hear the sounds of people preparing their evening meals. The smell of boiling cabbage in the air was oppressive. 
Govan pressed his ear to one of the plain brown doors and whispered, This one faces the front, but it's occupied. Screw it! Well, it kicked it down. Now three of them strode into a shabby space beyond. There was a tiny kitchen, and to the immediate left, and past that, a single large room furnished with well-worn couches and cots. Tattered blankets served as curtains. In one corner, a family of four cowered suddenly before the intruders. Mihalik and Carvon ignored them completely and crouched down by the window. They pulled back the corner of one of the blankets and peered outside. Pascal, on the other hand, pushed back the hood of his cloak and held, held up his hand. We're not here for you, he told the family. We just need some space. It'd be better if you went into the kitchen and stayed there. Wide-eyed and trembling, they scrambled away as they were told. Pascal joined the others. Aren't you the community hero? Malik jabbed. Pascal didn't much as a smile, but tightened his jaw and ground his teeth as he bit back a response. Carvon glanced at his minicom. It's sunset now. It gives us about ten hours until the ethereal makes an appearance. This is a good spot, Mahalik said. Mahalik replied, Might be a bit windy this high up, but I can compensate. Let's get set up. Pascal had been carrying the heaviest bag, and he dropped it onto the floor with a deep thud. Mahalik carefully took the large bundle that contained a sniper rifle from off his back and leaned it against the window frame. Carvon glanced over his shoulder, then rose and walked to where the apartment door still hung open. He was in the process of closing it when he realized that something was missing. He had just enough time to look around and ask, Where'd that family go? Before a squad of six Tal soldiers barreled in, Things happened very quickly after that. The apartment was cramped and offered the middle fields of view. Mahalik could see Carvon dive sideways into the kitchen, while somewhere off to his right, Pascal opened up with his lasgun. Two of the alien soldiers ran into the main room, their long rifles blazing. Mahalik and Pascal were crouched low, however, and the pulsing blast missed them entirely. The window and wall behind them burst into shards of glass, and chunks of plaster. Mollick's rifle was still in its waterproof cocoon. He drew his fang, and with a loud gasp, hurled the short sword-sized knife at the closest towel. It punched clean through the alien's armored chest plate and embedded itself up to the hilt in a fountain of blue gore. There were more shouts from Pascal and the sound of a struggle in the kitchen but such things were happening outside of Mahalik's tunnel vision. He dove forward, grabbed the dead Tal's rifle, and began spraying the doorway. Through the brilliant flashes of white, he could see the remaining blues pinch forwards and die. He stood up, the Xeno's gun still in his hands, and then he realized what he had done. He dropped the rifle with a sharp cry, and fiercely wiped his hands on his pant legs. He had touched a Xeno's weapon. No. Worse. He had actually used one. His hands felt dirtied, and his stomach heaved. Sorry. Sorry. I wasn't thinking. He stammered. Pasco laid a hand on his shoulder, sympathetically. Occasionally, terrible things had to be endured in the course of war. From the kitchen came the sound of body hitting the floor. The two men rushed around the corner to find Corvon leaning against the countertop. He had a last pistol in one hand and his fang in the other. He was panting heavily. There were two gutted towels sprawled across the cracked tile. Pascal pointed. You're it. Corvon looked down at his chest. There was a knife sticking out of his lower ribs. It was long and flat and had an ornate handle wrapped in black leather and adorned with golden studs. 
and looked more ceremonial than practical. God damn! Corvon sagged onto the floor, along the bodies. Maholik crouched down next to him. He wiped the red scarf from his forehead, waddled up into a ball, and stuffed it into Corvon's mouth. Their eyes met. When Corvon nodded quickly, Maholik yanked the tau blade out in a single fluid motion. Corvon kept quiet, to his credit, and bit down hard on Maholik's scarf. Pasco appeared to begin to dress the wound with a roll of sterile bandages. Maholik dropped the weapon in disgust. That's twice now, he gasped. Corvon spat out the scarf, tried to make light of things. Report all studious behavior, he said between gritted teeth. If I find those people again, it's carriage and neckties for the lot of them. We'll help you, Basco said. He tied off the field dressing with a sharp jerk that made Corvon wince. I can't believe our own people are buying into this greater good nonsense. Mohlock stood and glanced at the other bodies. Each of them wore a knife similar to that one that had stabbed Corvon. I'm getting tired of being right all the time, he said. You know, when these guys don't report in their home base, we're going to be up to our eyeballs and blues. With the script the mission. Pascal stood up and crossed the blasted window without a word. He picked up his heavy bag and walked to the door. No, he said, not being their eyes. This is too important. I heard as far away as I can and make the biggest distraction possible. It should draw most of the patrols away so that you can do what you have to do. Are you sure? Carvon asked as he staggered back to his feet. Pasco opened the bag. It was packed with a variety of explosives, from fist-sized frag grenades to monstrous demo charges. He smiled. I'm sure. Leave us one of those, Morlock said. Just in case. Pasco handed a demo charge to Carvon and turned without another word, and ran down the hallway. The two remaining men gathered up their equipment. Moloko happily wiped his knife clean, but was enraged to find that his canteen had been hit during the firefight. It was now nothing more than useless twisted metal. He left it where it lay, and headed back down the stairs with Cardiffon. We need to find a new position. The wounded man panted. Any ideas? Mahola crossed the ground floor lobby to where the main door hung partially open. Across the empty street, he could see a bloodier park, and beyond that, the curving alien buildings of the Tau, with no one to keep up a constant maintenance on Kithnia's native plant life. The park was rapidly becoming wild, Already the grass was as high as his waist in some places. Then he saw the tree. The tree with the wide trunk. The tree with the large burl of roots. The tree with the car. One, he replied. Seconds later, they had dashed across the street and began crawling through the park towards the shelter beneath the wreck. Now, as he lay there, staring up at the other side of the car, with one partner puking up his lungs, and the other most likely dead in the street somewhere, Maholik began to seriously consider that this might be the end for him. Close your eyes, Kisop said to him. You get this stuff in them. And you'll go blind. Maholok did as he was told and felt gruff hands smear the paste all over his brow 
mouth, cheeks, and nose. Emperor, this stuff reeks, he groaned. Not the baby devils. They love it. To them, you smell like corn-fed grog stick cooked just right. The old man stepped back to survey his work. Mohawk looked down on himself. He was naked from the waist up, dressed only in a pair of canvas pants and a pair of jungle boots. Every inch of his skin, Carvon had plastered a pungent mixture of animal blood and gluey toxivine sap. It was already beginning to harden in the infernal heat of the jungle. It looks like a giant scab, he said. His mentor gave him a rathering look and said, Doesn't matter what you look like. Doesn't matter what you have to endure. All that matters is how effective you are. Mark lowered his eyes and gave a weak, Yes, sir. He was ten years old. And Kisop was an ancient forty-five. It was an honor and a privilege to tutor under such an accomplished veteran. But the man had absolutely no sense of humor. I didn't hear you, he snapped. Yes, sir. Malik barked. Kisop folded his arms angrily across his chest. Better, he growled. Now, let's get over it one last time. What's your objective? Mahalak waved his arm. All around, Katajan fighters were finishing their preparations. Half were stationed up in the twisting trees, armed with a variety of rifles and heavy weapons. The rest were on the ground, hacking at the foliage with their machete-sized knives, while pouring barrels of thick black tar all around the perimeter of the cleared area. To draw the target out from hiding and into this kill zone, sir. He said. And how will you do that? Sir, when everyone is ready, the fastest runners will go down that cleared path. He pointed to a break in the jungle's vegetative wall. To the cave where the devil's nest is. They'll have buckets of the same stuff I'm covered in. And they'll start smearing the trees with it. Making a trail that leads back here. When one of the baby devils gets a good whiff of it, they'll come charging up, see me, and move in for the kill. That's when all of you will light the oil, trapping it. Then the shooters can kill it. What's your exit? I'll climb out on a rope ladder, lowered down to me by one of the senior fighters, sir. Kissup nodded with satisfaction, and then, with nothing more to be said, turned and walked away. Mohonok watched his teacher shamble up a tree to a safe height. One by one, the older Karachan fighters did likewise, until he was alone in the center of the circular clearing. For days there had been men out here preparing the ground by clearing away the brush and cutting down the undergrowth. Only one path had been left, ensuring that the gunners up in the trees would know exactly where to place their shots. Despite this, however, the success of this hunt all came down to him, Pollock. The Karachan devil, when fully grown, was a long as a freight train. It had multiple set legs, huge pincer-like claws, and a gigantic barbed tail that dripped lethal poison. It was an absolute monstrosity, and worse, it lived in nests. Each nest would usually contain half a dozen fully grown adults and twice as many devil spawn. They'd be called each season, lest the population become so great that they take over the planet. An old Kissop had, at some point in the distant past, decided that he might as well make use of his annual event. Every young Karachan had to thereafter endure this test of worthiness that they wanted to study under him. It was suicide to simply attack Devil Spawn, where they sheltered. The adults would boil up from out of the ground and kill everything that moved. 
Therefore, the jungle fighters had evolved means of luring the young devils away from their parents, where they could be killed one at a time. The foul mixture that Meholic was covered in smelled sickening to the adult devils, but when mixed with human sweat, proved intoxicating to the spawn. The creatures would follow the trail laid out for them, but had the uncanny ability to sense a trap. Meholic's job this day was to present himself as an irresistible target, a morsel so tasty that could override the spawn's cautionary instincts and run a hand long into its death. If he succeeded, his bravery would be proved and he would be gifted with a red headscarf of his own. If he died, well, it would just be another down cutter chan. Mahalik looked back up into the trees. The other jungle fighters had vanished into the intervening seconds camouflaging themselves seamlessly into the background. Suddenly, the ground began to rumble. Somewhere nearby, a flock of swamp herons took flight, squawking madly with fear. Then the devil spawn appeared in the middle of the cleared path. It was the biggest spawn that any of them could remember seeing. And afterwards, they all agreed that the creature was one year shy of becoming a full adult. It focused its enormous, coal-black eyes on the defenseless, half-naked child in front of it. Thick drool began to fall from its clawed and tentacled mouth. It reared up like a venomous snake might do, and then drove the entirety of its bulk at Mihorok. The boy leapt as far as one side as he could. The monster plowed into the earth, burying its head and sending chunks of mud flying. Mahalik knew he had to stay in the circle long enough for his Eldars to ignite the oil. Tough as it may be, immature devils had a fear of fire. And once the burial was set alight, the monster wouldn't dare try to break out through the flames. He rolled up over his dive and onto the fighting crouch. The wall of fire erupted suddenly, filling the air with a hellish heat an unbearable stench. There was gunfire too, but he hardly noticed. The braided vein rope, his sole escape, dropped down from an overhanging limb. His impromptu dive, however, had taken him far too away from it. The spawn was in the way, and he couldn't get around it. He looked desperately around for one of the elders, for Kissop, for anyone to come to his rescue but there was no seeing beyond the flames. He was trapped and completely alone, and his choice was a blunt one. Stay here and surely die, or climb out. The devil pulled its massive head out from the soil and shook it from side to side. Clods of dirt whipped into the trees. It flecked its mad gaze on Maholic again and bellowed. Then it reared up, just as it had before, and dove. Mohulok dodged to his left, and the abomination's head slammed down into the ground again. Then instead of moving to distance himself from it, Mohulok bolted straight forwards. While its face was buried in the soil, the boy ran up the creature's back and launched himself into the air. He caught the vine rope halfway up its lurch and climbed, hand over hand, with all his might. Kissop appeared long piece of red cloth clenched in his meaty fist. He handed it to Mihorok. Now that he was clear, the other Kalachans were free to shoot the spawn with abandon. Mihorok took the headband. He held it to his heaving chest and listened. Below him the devil rampaged in its cage of fire until it finally died. There's our boy, Kovan whispered. Mohawk's wandering mind snapped back to the present. He inhaled sharply and shook his head. Twice now, the memory of his 
indoctrination day had been dredged up by his subconscious to be splattered across the forefront of his mind. He knew why, of course. Understood of what it was that his instincts were trying to warn him. The tower would never be able to go into, into the fetid swamps and dark places his fellow Kalachans were now falling back into. And since they couldn't take their fight to the enemy, the Blues would have to draw their enemies out to more favorable ground. Trapped with the devil in the circle of fire, he muttered. Carvon looked up at him questioningly. Mark rolled over onto his belly. Forget it, he said as he nestled the muzzle of his rifle amidst the tree's burly roots. He settled his cheek into the stalk and peered through the scope. The sky was lightning as the sun crept up over the horizon. Let's have a look. The enemy base, which at a distance looked like a tumble of featureless white blocks and domes, leapt into clarity. Carvon hadn't been exaggerating when he had called it Tau Central. There were nearly a dozen different buildings in various stages of construction. From the reports he read, he was able to identify a few of them. A low-rounded barracks, a cluster of glowing pillars that were power generators, an arch structure with four angled towers attached to it that could only be command center. Of the others, he was not sure. Three tall towers at differing heights were still being erected, their bases hidden beneath a mesh of scaffolding, and their tops crowned with cranes. There was also a fourth crescent-shaped building, he assumed to be some kind of massive communications array. In the middle of this was an open courtyard, large enough to act as a landing field for a fleet of orbitable dropships. He was filling up now with Tau soldiers, all around them in identical suits of ochre-colored combat armor. They were kneeling in perfect rows and columns, preparing themselves to retrieve whatever inspirational wisdom their leader was about to bestow on them. Only have to kill one, Corvon replied, and we began reading off the numbers and coordinates displayed in his minicom. Maholik adjusted his angle to match. Finally, he settled his sights on some of the floating platform. It was round and white, with a podium molded into the front. Behind this was a high-backed chair, with oversized arms and stretched. And seated within was the Tao priest. You locked on? Arvon asked. Sitting right behind this flying pulpit. That's him. Mahalik flicked off the weapon's safeties with his little finger. We'll wait until he stands up, he said. He swallowed in a dry throat and then asked, Wind speed. Carvon glanced down at his sensory readout. Every four knots blowing from the west. In his crosshairs, the priest rose up from his seat and shuffled slowly up to the pedestal. Mahalik moved his rifle to the east and adjusted a fraction upwards to compensate for the way in which his bullet would drop during its long flight. I'm zero then, he murmured. Let's see if you are right, Carvon said. Mark listened to the blood rushing in his ears, and in the fractional space between one heartbeat and the next, where an exhale finishes, but the next intake of breath has yet to begin, he pulled the trigger. Thanks to the suppressor, there was no flash, and no retort. The only sound was a soft chuff as the bullet leapt forward. A little more than a second later, he had flown over the tall grass 
and above the heads of all the assembled Tao warriors, who had promptly mushroomed and bounced off the invisible force field that surrounded the ethereal. Mohawk looked over at Corvo, whose face had become pale, slack-jawed musk, disbelief. I told you so, he said. He withdrew his gun from the tree roots and rolled out from under the smashed car. Now comes the hard part. Let's move. Carvone rolled onto his side and stared back at him, shook his head. He gazed down at his chest where the bandages were stained deep red. A pool of blood had formed underneath him. All the while, he had been scanning and observing. I'm not coming, Ezra. I won't make it across the street. Never mind the Valkyrie. From his leather bag, Corvon pulled out the last of the demo charges. He popped the protective seal off the detonator and placed his thumb over the button. Mahalik felt a wave of regret crash over him. He opened his mouth to say something encouraging or comforting, but Corvon spoke first. Don't try to patronize me, he grunted. You know what you have to do. Mahalik started back towards the street, bent low with his rifle in hands. He constantly fought the urge to look back. Enemy soldiers would be messing on the wrecked car within seconds. And as much as he disliked Corvon, the man was still a fellow Karachan. Those who wore the red scarf rarely left brother behind. He quickly reached the entryway of the hab block. He slipped past the still open door, went to one of the front windows, and wiped away enough dirt with the back of his hand that he could look back onto the park. Cathuria's son had not yet crest the top of the other buildings, and the park was swirling with a mix of deep red shadows. An alarm was wailing somewhere, and scores of Tal soldiers were spilling out from their base. A cloud of robot drones swirled in the air above like a swarm of robotic bees, stirred to angry life by a solitary bullet. The demo charge erupted moments later. A massive glowing fireball consumed Corvon, the car, the tree, and more than 2,000 Tau who had been moving in to capture or kill the would-be assassins. Chunks of wood and twisted, burning pieces of metal rained down everywhere. The grass in the park was set alight, and in the concussion wave shattered every window that faced the street. Mahalik stood unfazed, as a hundred jagged shards of glass sliced into his bare chest. He could have used this diversion to make a good escape. He knew. But would that accomplish? No, he thought. It's up to me to light the fire. He hoisted his rifle and pressed the scope to his eye. For a moment there was nothing save for muffled screams and shouts in the apartments above him. The scene outside was one of destruction and shock stillness, and he saw one of the blues rise up from where he had been sent reeling into a tall grass. Mahalik exhaled as he pulled the trigger, and the faceplate of the alien's helmet folded inwards with a spray of blood and bone. His right hand flew up the bolt, even as he scanned for another target. The spent cartridge dropped to the floor, and he reloaded with an almost supernatural calm and speed. Another tower appeared only to go down again with a shot sent a mass. Again he reloaded, found a fresh target, and let the third round fly. A fourth, a fifth. He dropped the spent magazine to the floor and slapped the fresh one in. Search, acquire, fire, reload. Again. 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 Relentless. Within a minute, he had hit and killed a total of ten Tau, and he exhausted two of his ammunition clips. It was more than enough to get their attraction. He was turning to go when he caught something out of the corner of his eye. They weren't lasers per se, but they were more like beams of pale blue smoke, discernible only because of the way they played over the powdered glass that covered the floor of the lobby. He had no idea what they were, but it couldn't be good. 
He dashed forward, diving over a couch. Behind him, a volley of small missiles detonated across the building's facade. The door turned into splinters. Bricks and mortar tore through them. Part of the ceiling gave way with the impact, and plaster rained down on Hollock's back. A searing pain tore through his left arm. He remained crouched behind the sofa, his head down, and he cursed. The missiles suggested the presence of light artillery battery, or worse yet, a vehicle. Jesus, he thought. This is supposed to be a contest between infantry. Wallach knew he couldn't stay here. Sprawling on the floor, he began crawling away. His multiple cuts smeared themselves across the carpet, leaving a trail of blood. But it couldn't be helped. As he rounded the corner, he took a second to see why it was exactly that his arm hurt so much. At the start, he discovered that a large piece of steel window frame had impaled itself right between his radius and his ulna. He stood up and yanked it from his flesh. A jet of blood, the same color as his headband, painted a dripping curve along the wall. He ran down the back of an alleyway, bashed a metal fire door open with his shoulder, and emerged into a parking lot. He had only jogged a few steps when one of the Tao trackers moved at full run, emerged from the side alley. The Tao skidded to a halt, apparently surprised to encounter Mahorok outside the building already. For the briefest of moments, the two stared at each other. Then the alien began to raise his carbine. Mahorok, with his longer reach, swung his rifle like a club and bashed the Tao upside the head. Then he closed the distance, dropped his gun, and yanked his fang from its sheath. He swung the blade in a horizontal, decapitating arc, but the last second the Tao blocked the attack with a forearm. Mahorok, who had assumed that the fight would be over as soon as it begun, was taken aback. Undoubtedly so, as he was kicked fiercely in the shin. The two of them grappled for a moment longer before Mahorok was finally able to twist his opponent's arm behind his back and stab him through the chest. The Tao started to spasm and then went limp. Mahorok withdrew the blade to find it covered in thick cyan-colored gore. And then through time, of the essence, he stopped to wipe it clean on the alien's pant leg. No filthy Xenos blood would be allowed to stain his fang. He was off again, moving down the narrow, twisting streets of the colony. The remaining Tao attackers were close behind him. Of that, he was certain. It was a race now, a true contest to see which species had a greater skill and fortitude. Before long, he was outside the town and waving his way through the thickening jungle. He was trying to take the most convoluted path he could think of, but his head was beginning to swim. He sagged against a tree, breathless. The cuts on his chest were minor things, but the hole in his forearm was near crippling. Blood poured from the wound. His right hand looked as if it had been dipped in red paint. He used his headscarf as a makeshift bandage and carried on. It was nearly noon by the time Mahorok neared the extraction point. For the rest of the morning, he had managed to catch a few signs that he was still being pursued. A snapping branch here, an alien scent on the wind there. However, all was quiet now. Through the trees, he could see the Valkyrie that had ferried themselves and the others in. Its rear hatch was open and looked as inviting as a mother's embrace. He was far gone. He knew that. He was exhausted, starved, dehydrated, cut, bled out, and burned. Still, was almost over. He stumbled out into the open and towards the transport. Morlock was steps from the boarding ramp when the Tau energy blast hit him. They came from all directions, striking his chest, back, arm, thigh, and head. The world vanished in a succession of white flashes, and he collapsed on the jungle floor. He was dimly aware that a portion of his left leg was now missing, and it seemed somehow inconsequential. He could hear the little aliens moving through the grass towards him, coming to either confirm the kill or finish him off. 
He lay there for a moment face down in the mud, thinking to himself how perfect an ambush it had been. And he painstakingly raised himself up, because when this happened, he was determined to be on his feet for it. There were five of the alien trackers standing in a rough circle around him. Their weapons raised, their armor, nothing more than protective chest plates and reinforced gloves, it was red, not ochre. The better color to blend into this planet's native plate. A few had black scorch marks across their combat vest, but he guessed was a result of Carvon's heroic last stand. The crests on their helmets were very tapered, with a single red eye lens that regarded him impassively. The rifles appeared short and stubby. Mahorok nodded with subconscious approval. Light armor for greater mobility and a carbine so that not to catch on foliage or rubble. These blues obviously weren't run-of-the-mill soldiers. They were specialists. And finally found his alien counterparts. Nicely done, he croaked. I used to carry counter-tracking trick I know of. And you still trailed me. Outmaneuvered me, too. You guys are good. <laughs> no question. You must be the best in your army. One of the tiles said something. To Malik's ears, it sounded short and choppy, like a crackling of a log in a bonfire. He didn't speak the language, and so had no idea whatever he was being praised or damned. It didn't matter, regardless. Take him! He shouted. The Tau all died. Some of them were shot through the chest, others in the head. The bodies hit the ground simultaneously. And the fittings of the maid, of that made Maholic break out into <laughs> uncontrollable laughter. <laughs> Unity was important to the Blues, after all. All around him, a dozen Katachan snipers were jumping down from the treetop perches. Three of them raced over the Maholic, eased him back to the ground, and began applying aid to his wounds with medipacks and cloth bandages. Did you get them more? Maholic managed to ask. His fit of hysterical laughter had left as suddenly as it had come on. Everyone, the youngest of the attendants replied. You had them right to us, sir. Just like you said what happened. Malt closed his eyes. The drugs were not only taking away his pain, but they were making his body a dim, distant thing. He was only half aware as his combat brethren rolled him onto a stretcher and carried him into a Valkyrie. Then they were in the air, flying low over the canopy of the rainforest. The young attendant leaned over him to check his pulse. Sir, can I ask you something? Mahalik's voice was a raspy slur. What is it? The blues. Will they come for us after what we did? I'm sure they will. But they won't find us. They won't be able to get to us. We killed the best they had. The kid nodded, and then asked, How'd you know? I mean, how'd you know that the whole thing was a trap? Mahalik struggled to focus on the boy. He was not more than a few years past initiation. Mahalik thought his skin was still reflectively free of scars, and his beard stubble was downy and patchy at best. He wore the red scarf, but obviously still had much to learn. It was in the files, Mahalik said. <coughs> Under military doctrine, do you know what the Tau call the battle companies? The young man shook his head. Hunter cadres. They see themselves as being descended from great hunters. When I read that, I knew... They're just setting out bait to catch the best of us. But you turned it around on them. The boy was grinning with newfound understanding. 
You left us at the landing site to nail them when they came far enough away from the headquarters and made bait of yourself. Mahalik was suddenly reminded of old Kissop's words to him, that whenever he had to endure was irrelevant for so long as his actions were, in the end, effective. I'm used to it, he said coldly. Mahalik closed his eyes and began to drift away. He could sleep for just a few hours, he told himself. And then it'd be right back to work. He was a senior most officer in the resistance now. And he had an insurgency to organize. Well, dang. Now I want to start a Katachan army. <laughs> I can see why so many of my other friends love to have them. And not just for the rules I did for my version, but of uh, 40k, uh, but for the lore behind it as well, and them by themselves. This actually opened my eyes, because the only two regiments I knew of was the Valhallen Ice Warriors and the Death Corps of Krieg. One because of Kyphus Kane, and the other because I have a full army of Krieg that are, well... Not from Forge World. <laughs> love their website, love all the models they have, and they come better, apparently, than the actual Forge World ones. Which is funny because I got kicked out of a GW store for having them because the person running the store said, Hey, those models are way too good. Get out. They're not real. <laughs> Oh, man, it's like $30 for 10 dudes. It's amazing. I, I love all the work that they do. And I can't wait to see what other things they're going to be putting up on their website. Um, I'm not going to say what it is because... Um, or who they are because I don't want them to lose um, their uh, website. And I don't want them to lose, well, profits. Because, um, GW will 100% go after them, and it sucks because they are better. If not, yeah, they're better than Forge World sometimes. Anyways, let us say thank you to our ongoing Patreon supporters of the channel who make the channel continue even when YouTube decides to bend me over and say take it thank you to Mr. Crossman123 Cocoa Zach Keller Coffee Meltdown480 Eldrick Maldred Fortis Uno and Daskovsky was right and the new one stepping up to bat being Lilac NPC thank you each and every one of you for being Patreon supporters if you want to be a Patreon supporter, you can in the link in the description down below. What we do there, and what I do there, is I post bloopers when they happen, uh, not safe for work drawings, uh, different types of drawings, just things I've worked on for commissions and whatever. Um, uh, you get to see projects that are on the way before anyone else. You get to see what I'm working on before anyone else. You get to um, take part in votes of things. That will happen before anyone else does. Which reminds me, I need to do another vote. Anyways. I've been me, you have been you, and thank you for watching another one of these amazing videos. Subscribe, like the video, and leave a comment. About if you want to start another Katachan army. Or if you already own one, what's it like to own those old wonderful models because I'm actually thinking of getting a squad or two just to add to my themed army oh yeah the video ended after I started talking about patreon stuff so I don't know what you're still doing here
Maybe waiting for a funny blooper or some random sound effect. Because I am a master of voices. A voice actor has many voices and many different things that you can do. As you can clearly tell from this video. First time you step into your brand new 2023 F-150, you'll be squirming, squealing and kicking your feet like a little girl. Motorized Award 2020 F-350 has everything you need to hold as many bulls as possible to your loving wife. Built for BBC Tough at Ford Truck Month. We make cars that go vroom vroom. I think you should buy a truck, I suppose. We know you're here because you too broke to own a ram and have a tiny penis and want to overcompensate. <laughs> this for a truck month, for a limited time only, I'm getting my balls crushed by rocks. <laughs> Hey, God. Hey, God, one more. <laughs> one more. One more. Act now at Ford Truck Month. Any purchase over $70,000 will come with a free hook or meat tenderizer. If any of you so-called country boys don't find butt freckles to be fucking cute, turn in your man card. <laughs> His bravery would be be. B B B B B, and a deafening <clears throat> being sick fun <clears throat> to the satellite globes around it. Got a lot of globules in my throat. Ugh. I'm getting sick. <clears throat> That's fucking weird. What the fuck? I'm not going to question that any further. <clears throat> um, where was I? Oh, yeah. Um, Lane Downton. <clears throat> oh, shit, you're still here? What are you still doing here? Go. The video's finally, finally over. It's done. There's nothing else. See you in the next one. Goodbye.